Sure. Dr. Strathy, thank you very much for uh, coming on and, and, and welcome. Thanks very much for having me. It's a pleasure. This is my first Q&A on Instagram. So, well, well, we're uh, we're very pleased you're joining us today, and uh, I, I wanted to just start off very briefly, um, uh, just to see if you could talk a little bit about your own experience with um, infectious disease, which you you talk about in your book, and I'm curious about how that informs the way you are thinking about uh, this particular pandemic. Right. Well, I'm an infectious disease epidemiologist by training. I'm Canadian and American. I, I'm trained at the University of Toronto, and um, I've spent most of my career studying HIV and working with underserved populations. And it wasn't until um, 2015 when my husband acquired a superbug infection. That's a bacteria that's resistant to multiple antibiotics um, that you know, really firsthand, I experienced how life can go from being absolutely normal to just like turned upside down. My husband was near death. Um, he was in the hospital for nine months. He, he was medevaced home um, first from Egypt to Germany and then back here to San Diego. And, you know, he was on a ventilator. So I know exactly what it's like. He was four months in the ICU. Um, the doctors and nurses at the University of California, San Diego, hospital were just amazing and my heart goes out to them in this epidemic right now that we're facing with COVID-19 because they don't even have enough personal protective equipment to protect themselves and you know I, I put on a, a mask and a gown and gloves every single day and stood by my husband and luckily he he lived um, and uh, you know he co-wrote the book with me and um, our story is kind of a cautionary tale because the superbug pandemic is lurking behind the COVID-19 pandemic. We're going to have one person every three seconds dying from a superbug infection by the year 2050. So we got to get through this one, but there's another one right behind it. So this is practice. All right. Well, well, thank you for, for sharing that story. And, you know, uh, despite the uh, tragedy that kind of got afflicted there, you know, I'm glad your husband made it out okay. Glad he was able to co-write the book with you. Um, I want to focus specifically on this epidemic. Can you tell us what we know so far? And, you know, I realize this is a very new disease, but uh, what do we know about how this virus spreads? Well, um, this virus is, is, the name is SARS-CoV-2. It's kind of a um, you know, a difficult um, name, but it, that's what causes COVID-19. It's a coronavirus. It's called that because under the electron microscope, it looks like a crown. And um, it's a new virus. Um, there are many other kinds of coronaviruses that affect human and animal populations. This is a new one that was believed to have jumped over to humans from bats, maybe through another animal like a pangolin. Um, it's still unclear, but that's why we have no immunity in ep epidemiology speak we call it herd immunity um mm -hmm. kind of borrowed from animals so we we don't have any memory immunologic memory in our population and that's why this um it, disease is spreading um through the population and um it's a very serious one it's much more serious than the flu it's mm -hmm. estimated that um about one to three percent of people who acquire it are going to die um, and people who have underlying conditions um, or are heavy um, or smoke are going to be at more risk of complications. It's spread through um, droplets. And so when people are coughing or mm -hmm. sneezing, um, little tiny droplets that are even smaller than you can see are spreading through the air. And if someone is close by and they, you know, breathe that in or they, um, you know, touch, a, 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 say, a doorknob or a cell phone that someone else has touched who, who has the virus, that can transmit it. And um, we're seeing that, um, you know, this virus is likely, um, if, you, if one person has it, he's, he or she is likely spreading it to maybe two to three other people. Um, we're learning more about it as time goes on. But um, if the U.S. does nothing, um, we stand to see up to 200,000 infections um, that lead to death. And so it's very serious that people should be sheltering in place, regardless of whether or not your governor has indicated that you should do so. Listen to scientists. Yeah. So um, one thing that, that kind of gets, um, you know, bandied around and uh, 
uh, is this idea of, you know, kind of droplet transmission versus airborne transmission versus aerosol transmission. Um, can you explain the difference between those terms and then where, you know, SARS-CoV-2 falls, you know, in that? Well, I mean, there is some controversy about whether or not, um, you know, this virus can be transmitted, you know, in, in the air without um, an aerosol or a, or a droplet. Um, and at this point, the WHO is, um, you know, contesting that. Um, there have been studies done in the lab that suggest mm -hmm. that this virus can live, um, say, 24 hours on cardboard, two to three days on plastic or stainless steel, and that it can persist in the air for, say, three hours. But whether or not that really translates to the real world, like what you do in the laboratory doesn't necessarily, you know, translate to what's happening out in the community. So we're going to be learning more about it, but it's clearly very infectious. And mm -hmm. that's why it's important that um, people wash their hands. Um, it's much better to wash your hands with soap and water than it is to use hand sanitizer, for example. And um, it's thought that the CDC is going to be coming out with recommendations soon for people to be wearing, um, you know, something across their face. Right now we have a mask shortage at our hospitals, so we don't want to take away masks from healthcare workers. But anybody who is infected with this should be wearing a mask. Um, and everybody else, I mean, we can make our own masks or wear bandanas across our face. And that's probably a good idea at this point. Mm -hmm. So how how much of a difference though did the did the cloth masks or bandanas make? Because you know um, there've been some studies at least with flu spread that I'm sure you're familiar with that in some cases wearing a mask, whether it's improper or the wrong kind of mask, can actually increase your risk of infection. So like what are some best practices if you think that you might be in a situation where you need a mask and and when should you you know maybe not use one or or is there a type of mask you shouldn't use? Right. Well, I mean, I'm definitely not a mask expert, but um, I think we all are going to become one pretty soon. Um, there's going to be some new guidelines that the CDC is going to be issuing, but mm -hmm. definitely you don't want to have a material that creates a lot of humidity. Um, mm -hmm. And so if there's a lot of humidity, that could lead to the virus being more persistent and, and actually, you know, multiplying faster because you're mimicking, you know, what's going on in your, in your respiratory tract. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing, though, is that when people wear, you know, masks or gloves, it can give people a false sense of security. So, you know, I was at um, a supermarket, um, you know, not too long ago, and I saw um, a checkout clerk wearing gloves, and then she rubbed her nose, and then, you know, she went on, and she was, you know, going and touching people's stuff and moving it along the line. And it's, it's not practical for a checkout clerk to change her, their gloves you know, at Costco, say, you know, every time it, this, there's a new person in line. So you just need to be mindful of the fact that, that um, if you were wearing a mask, for example, that's going to maybe um, discourage you from rubbing your, your face. But it's not necessarily, you know, going to be 100% perfect. Mm -hmm. So a um, uh, question from the, uh, from the audience we have here about the social distancing. Um, what do you think, what are like the best and worst case scenarios for how long we're going to have to, you know, stay at home and, and, and uh, look presentable for Zoom calls? Yeah, well, <laughs> that's a good question. I mean, if I knew the answer to that question, you know, I'd be rich, right? Because that's what everybody wants mm -hmm. to know right now. And it's all up to us to ensure that we are sheltering in place because this next month, at least in the United States, is going to be um, the peak transmission period. Um, the University of Washington um, and others have done a lot of modeling. The one that the um, president's task force presented yesterday um, at their briefing was based on um, the group um, at the University of Washington. And you can Google that and, and look not just at the US, but at your state and see when the peak period is going to be. And now for, um, they're updating these models all the time because a state like Florida has yet to have a shelter in place order. And the, every day that that's delayed, that means that there's more transmissions happening out in the community. So it's really important that, um, you know, you, you don't see this as a, as a fixed moment in time. What we're doing now, each and every one of us by staying at home, is um, flattening the curve. And mm -hmm. I live in California, in Southern California in particular, 
we had um, a shelter in place order by our governor Newsom very early on, um, even before in New York. And that means that um, we can see that the rate of new infections in Southern California is actually slower than other parts of the country. And so that's encouraging. It's still too early for us to say whether or not, you know, the end of April is going to be, you know, when we can actually stop sheltering in place or, and, and, you know, stop social distancing. But um, it's going to be a long haul because um, the best case scenario is probably 100 to 200,000 deaths in the U.S. alone. Um, the worst case is in the millions. And um, I'm really concerned that we don't have a lot of federal level coordination. We're seeing that governors are, are having to request PPEs for, you know, the hospitals and ventilators, et cetera. So we have these shortages and the shortages are going to lead to more infections. And if there's a segment of the population left behind, that puts us all at risk. Um, you know, uh, from your experience, you know, studying virus spread epidemiology, um, why is it that, that so many countries, you know, like the United States, like Italy, like um, other countries in Europe, uh, why do we seem so unprepared for this pandemic? Well, actually, a couple of years ago, we were more prepared than we are now. Um, the mm -hmm. federal government disbanded the pandemic preparedness unit and uh, let go a lot of people that were in positions where we could have been more coordinated. So um, that's one of the big reasons. And unfortunately, you know, the president did say early on that this was a hoax and um, that he thought that it was all going to you know, disappear very soon. And, and now he's you know, having to backtrack and say, you know, no, uh, I, he hasn't said that he was wrong, but he's pointing out that, you know, we are in a, a very serious pandemic and it's not going to get better anytime soon. Um, I'm seeing some questions that are popping up on the screen. I don't know if you want me to uh, address any of these or you're going to pick out some because, um, and anybody who doesn't get their questions answered, you know, you can say I'm on Twitter more than I'm on Instagram. I'm the same handle change in the world. And I'm happy to try to answer any questions. And it is about politics, unfortunately, because uh, as someone says, this isn't about politics. Well, you know, um, some of the decisions that are being made or not made are and are affecting our lives. So, well, great. And, and, and just uh, Dr. Strathy, just so you know, our, our social team is actually uh, picking out some of the common questions okay, that people great. are asking and letting me know so I can uh, pass this along to you. Um, so one question uh, that that's popped up and, and fairly common is, uh, do I need to worry um, about visiting my parents um, if uh, if I've been locked down for the last couple of weeks, if I haven't gone anywhere um, if I want to go visit someone, like, A, like, should I even do that? Or, or B, if I do, like, what precautions should I take? Well, what we know about the incubation period for this virus is that it's, um, it's, and it's like the tail end of it is about 15 days. So mm. if you've been um, sheltering in place and you don't have any symptoms and it's 15 days or, or more, then, you know, I think that it's relatively safe to visit a family member. But, um, you know, if your parents are older than you by definition, right? And so um, if you do have the infection and you're, say, asymptomatic because it's thought that there's about 12 to 15 percent of people may not have symptoms, but they're infected, um, you could be putting older people at risk and they're going to have a higher chance of serious complications. So I wouldn't say it's zero risk. But um, what we know right now is that about two weeks is, is the, the um, incubation period. It, it can be as soon as three days or as late as 15 days. Okay. All right. And we have time for about one more question uh, before we have to wrap this up. So uh, a question that, that I'm coming, you, you, you mentioned kind of the, the lack of PPE and uh, the, the lack of equipment. Um, so I'm going to make this a two-part question uh, to kind of get a, a broad variety of concerns we've been seeing uh, come across from the audience. Uh, one, um, how much are healthcare professionals at risk from this? And, and then two, uh, you know, you mentioned that there are other pandemics possibly lurking around the corner. What can we learn from this experience to be better prepared for next time? 
Well, healthcare workers are definitely at risk because they're seeing people every day that are infected and that are shedding virus. And they're put, they're, they have to be close up to that person to give them care. And if they're intubating somebody, that can, can create an aerosol. So they are the people that we need to protect the most because if there aren't healthcare workers to look after us when we go to hospital, you know, we're, we're going to be at a much higher risk of dying. And so we're very lucky here in the U.S. that we do have a healthcare system that is, you know, um, intact, but it's a, it's at considerable risk of not being able to protect people. Um, in the future, um, I hope that what we're learning from this epidemic is that we really need to have a pandemic preparedness office, and it, it requires uh, federal coordination. We can't have governors, you know, competing with one another to get uh, PPEs for their state and. And so right now, um, you know, we're in a situation where there, there's a lot of uncertainty about the future. So I know that people want to know when they can, you know, stop social distancing. But um, we're hopeful, though, that if you've been infected, um, that you um, will have some immunity. Um, we don't know for sure because we still need to do those studies. But it's thought that perhaps one to two years of immunity um, might protect you from um, th this virus if you see it again. All right. Well, Dr. Strathy, thank you so much for uh, uh, taking our questions and, and taking the time out of your day. I'm sure you're really busy um, at this point in time. Uh, so so uh, on behalf of Forbes and our audience, I, I want to thank you.